sound good. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today again uh, for another session of um, Summer MS Lecture Series. Uh, we have our, our uh, speaker for today is Dr. Hedwig Kuypers. Uh, Dr. Kuypers received her uh, master's in biopharmaceutical sciences, and after that, her PhD in immunology at Leiden University in the Netherlands. After this, uh, she moved to Stanford University to study factors that affect the inflammatory response in MS as a postdoc in the labs of Dr. Lauren Steinman and Dr. Paul Wallicki. She joined the MS NEAR team at the University of Calgary as an uh, assistant professor in 2018. Uh, here she studies how um, cells that uh, reside in the CNS affect the immune cells that enter the CNS in MS um, and vice versa. Um, and this is what she's gonna talk about today. So before we start, I just want to make a point that um, we highly encourage uh, our new trainees to ask questions. Um, we have very uh, highly experienced faculty and presenters here, so please do not hesitate uh, to come up with a question. So over to you, Hedvig. Thank you. Thank you, Nito. And uh, yes, um, do ask questions. Um, I don't know if I will always see if there's a raised hand or something in the chat, but Nito can keep an eye on that as well. And if I missed anything, we'll just do it at the end. Um, any questions you have uh, are good. So yeah, let's uh, don't be shy. Okay, let me start sharing my screen there. Okay, can you all see my slide? Yep, good. Yes. Let me grab a pointer. There we go. So yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit about how the cells that are inside the brain um, in, interact with the cells that shouldn't be in the, inside the brain, the immune cells, uh, and kind of how um, what we know about that uh, and, and uh, it goes a little bit both ways. It's um, it's mostly what I'll be talking about is how the the cells that that are in the brain uh, kind of attract immune cells, but also how they can influence them, and then a little bit the other way around. So to start, um, let's talk a little bit about the immune response. Um, so later in this series, there will be a, a, a bigger lecture on the immunology of MS. So I won't go into too much detail here about what happens there, but just to give you kind of a crash course of uh, in immunology. So um, the immune system is actually a very intricate interplay between a lot of different um, mediators or a, a lot of different uh, uh, parts that, that come together. So usually, uh, we think of the immune system as having two arms, as you would may, and one of them is kind of the innate immunity that you have, that you're born with, that doesn't really change, it, it always functions the same, and this acts to kind of sense the first um, instance when something goes wrong. So when you have a bacteria or a virus that comes into your uh, body or you know something else. Uh, this is, these are the guys that actually notice that, and then these ones will instruct your adaptive arm of immunity. And these are the cells that are actually really good at then getting rid of um, whatever is threatening your body, and also to keep a memory of that, so that next time when something enters, something similar enters again, the, uh, they can actually really quickly get rid of it. So this is the adaptive immunity, and these um, the components of this this arm are you might have heard of T cells, T lymphocytes. Um, B cells, B cells are the ones that make the antibodies. So this is what we, for instance, want now in this uh, COVID-19 um, crisis where we're hoping to get antibodies against uh, a coronavirus and these are made by your B lymphocytes. But to get those, you have to go through this whole process of the innate immunity actually telling the adaptive immunity what they should make antibodies against or what they should adapt. Uh, and then, like I said, once this is established, then if you have another infection, uh, they can respond really quickly, quickly to a specific pathogen. 
So um, how is this instruction, how does that go? So, um, and here I'm, I'm focusing mostly on T cells because they're very important in a lot of immune responses. And um, they're also very important in MS, not to say that other cells are not, but we know a lot about how T cells are involved. So how does a T cell know what to attack? Well, it gets presented what to attack, and it, it gets presented by antigen presentation cells, presenting cells. So these are of the innate uh, arm, and what they do is they gobble up whatever comes in uh, that shouldn't be in your body, but could also be, you know, dead cells or something like that. But if it's something foreign, they um, they recognize that, and then they express it on their um, cell surface or they, they kind of present it on their cell surface in specific molecules that are called uh, MHC class 2 molecules, major histocompatibility uh, molecules. So in this whole complex there's a, like a nice pocket that can present a small fraction of whatever entered and they then present this to T cells and then these T cells know what to uh, react against. This is not enough. So just having MHC class two with a peptide is not enough. They need some, these T cells need some ex, uh, extra boosts to actually make them go attack. So um, one other signal is uh, other molecules that are around this MHC class two uh, peptide complex. And these are co-stimulatory molecules. And then um, these antigen presenting cells can also make a lot of soluble factors and we call those cytokines, and these uh, are another way that these uh, T cells get activated. And you need that again for to have a good um, immune response. So normally this is a really good thing, right? Because it uh, protects our body from invaders. Um, so wh why why should we have it, and why should we not? So for instance, in the brain, there's usually not. Um, a lot of uh, immune components there because this whole process of getting rid of um, pathogens and invaders is really messy. So I always compare it to uh, say a, a SWAT team that didn't get too many instructions and they're not too smart so they just go in to whatever building and room they need to go into and they have to find their target but they don't really care who else is there? So they just start shooting around and arresting people, everybody who's in there. And they don't really care whether it's the criminal or some innocent bystander. So that's kind of what inflammation is. Whenever the immune system starts to get rid of something, everything that's around it gets affected too. So this is really messy. And you might not want that in the brain where you have a lot of precious connections and a lot of precious cells that are very hard to, um, to replenish afterwards. So normally in a healthy system, um, there is not a lot of um, immune trafficking as we call it in the brain or in the spinal cord. Uh, and that's because there's a really good separation between the brain and the rest of the body, uh, which is called the blood brain barrier, which is around the blood vessels that go into, um, into the brain. Um, there's also, there are not that many of these professional antigen presenting cells that could instruct uh, T cells in this case uh, to do their work. Uh, there's generally in a healthy situation, very low levels of MHC. So they don't even, you know, they, even if they're there, they can't really present a lot. And there's actually factors that tell the immune system to back off uh, or even to tell it an immune cell, cell when it comes in to die and not, you know, then not do anything. And um, MS is a clear example of what goes wrong if the immune system does go into the brain. And in this case, it's more than it just going in. It also recognizes um, uh, parts, components of the brain, right, myelin. So for instance, what we see when this happens in MS, it is just an overview of all kinds of things that happen in MS. So for instance, we see here's a blood vessel and you can see lymphocytes the, that have these dense, dark, uh, small nuclei. So these lymphocytes, uh, they kind of go into the, um, into the tissue of the brain. So that's one of the things and that's what we don't want because we see macrophages, which are 
uh, one of those innate um, cell types. And these macrophages actually have contained myelin in them. So they're gobbling up myelin. Um, we can see that there's damage to the myelin, but also damage to the axon. So in, in red here, you see that myelin, you can see that it's kind of stripped off. It's not on this nice axon anymore. And this big blob actually means that this axon in green was cut and is now swelling up. So you can imagine that the signal can't go through anymore. You can see how um, neurons and axons are, try are changing their function. So this is a redistribution of their, um, of their ion channels and, and their metabolic machinery. Uh, and this is bad because it's in a certain place for a certain reason, right? For a good transduction. Um, sometimes there are attempts to remyelinate, but in the, in the long term, uh, we see a lot of activation of the uh, cells inside the brain that can help the immune system. We'll get to this, microglia and astrocytes. And all of this together, we know from MS, um, is pretty bad, right? Um, so this is what we're working with. So we have to figure out why this happens. So let's zoom in a little bit on these, these different cell types and I'll go in more detail after this. So we have an interplay, as I already said, between cells that normally are in the brain. So we have, you know, you have your neuron here with myelin around the axons, all the dendrocytes making it myelin. And then around this we have microglia and we have astrocytes and these are two cell types that are very important in talking to immune cells not to say that there might not be interaction with the other oligodendrocytes and neurons as well but we focus on on these two glia uh, but then we have these immune cells that we find uh, macrophages t cells b cells all that and they all kind of come together in these ms lesions so when we look at the immune cells uh, there's, a, like I said, there's a lot of different kinds of cells and uh, there's kind of a couple that, that we will focus on here and that we know a little bit about more. So we have our T cells and they come in two flavors. You have your helper T cells, which are also called CD4 T cells because they express uh, CD4. Um, and these um, are very good in also orchestrating the immune response. So they make a lot of factors that orchestrate the immune response. So they're kind of these, these Normally, there's these kind of superheroes that help you fight off uh, pathogens. Uh, there's CD8 uh, T cells, cytotoxic T cells, also called killer cells, and they kill any cell that is infected by a virus. So even uh, if uh, the pathogen, in this case a virus, gets inside a cell and, and you wouldn't be able to see it um, through the normal or the, the other ways that the, the immune system recognizes them, uh, these um, killer cells will still recognize that the cell has been infected and then kill that cell. Uh, then we have our B cells, like I mentioned before, they make your antibodies. Another really important cell type is the macrophage, which can be derived from monocytes. So monocytes circle in the blood and uh, macrophages are usually in the tissue, but when monocytes go into the tissue, they can become macrophages. And like I said before, they, and their primary function is to gobble up stuff. Um, and in the case of MS, unfortunately, they gobble up myelin. Um, there's plenty of other immune cells that we also know play a role in MS, but I won't be talking too much about this. Um, and then with regards to the players inside the brain, uh, I think last week you heard a nice talk about the microglia already. Um, and um, so I mentioned these, so, so we think of microglia as being the main kind of immune cell of the brain and they resemble macrophages. So they come from the same lineage as macrophages. So they're kind of the macrophages of your brain. Um, so they, they too can uh, eat up um, pathogens or myelin. But then we also have astrocytes, and astrocytes have many, many different functions in the healthy brain, but they can also talk to immune cells. And then, of course, we have our oligodendrocytes um, that uh, make the myelin that um, enables, uh, that, that isolates axons, uh, insulates I axons, um, making for better um, signal transduction, but it also protects axons, right? Um, and so today I'll be focusing on microglia and astrocytes again. Okay, so 
how can these different cell types, microglia, astrocytes on one hand, and infiltrated immune cells, how, how can they influence each other? So, well, they could actually touch each other and um, interact in that way. So maybe one cell has a, a ligand and the other cell has a receptor. They can touch in that way and uh, induce signals there, or they can do it through antigen presentation, like I said. Um, but there's also a lot of indirect contact. So this is, uh, due, um, regulated by the factors that these cells make. And I already mentioned these cytokines. These are small proteins that tell immune cells what to do. So they can either tell the immune cells to become more active or they can uh, tell them to become less active. Uh, chemokines are kind of a, a certain type of cytokines that tell cells where to go. And then there's a lot of other factors that can uh, affect an immune response as well. So how do immune cells do get into the brain? And uh, because I just said that it's actually very limited there uh, entering into the brain. Well, there are a couple of different uh, ways. Uh, so they can actually go, do go across the blood brain barrier and go from the blood into the parenchyma, the tissue as we call it. Um, and they have, they traffic, so they traffic through these perivascular spaces uh, over this, this uh, very tight barrier. And when there's inflammation, there's actually um, mechanisms that help them do that. Um, but they can also come from the fluid that's in and around our brain. And as you might know, we have ventricles here in the, in the middle of our brain that contain this fluid. But this fluid also goes all the way around our brain and uh, cells can also enter from, they can go into the cerebral spinal fluid first and then into um, your tissue. Um, so how does that happen? Because it's not easy, right? Um, there's this whole barrier. So uh, this is called, uh, um, the process that does this is called diapodesis. And how this uh, works is, so you have your immune cells going through the bloodstream and they're moving really fast, right? So first what they, what happens is that they kind of get caught by something and um, tethered to the, the wall of the blood vessel. Then they, that slows them down, they start rolling along until they get a very good grip by these adhesion molecules and then they can go either in between the cells of the a blood vessel or they can actually go through these cells and some studies have shown that they actually prefer to go through cells rather than go in between cells which still kind of boggles my mind but apparently that is easier for them um, so both of these uh, um, ways actually uh, happen so if we get a cross section so this is this blood vessel right and then here is a cross section of that. So you have your blood vessel wall here, endothelial cells of the wall, and then uh, the inside of the blood vessel. And then this, all this blue is kind of the inside of the brain, of the brain tissue. Um, and you, again, you can see this cell going through the blood brain barrier into the parenchyma. So what are the factors that they need to do this? So I already said they need something to actually hook them onto this wall and, and really get that good grip. So these are adhesion molecules. They need something to tell them actually to go in there. So these are the chemokines. And then they also need um, ways to kind of break up this barrier if that it hasn't been broken down yet. Uh, and these are proteases, um, MMPs are very important in this ma matrix metalloproteases. And we, I won't really uh, talk a too much about that. I'll be focusing mostly on the uh, chemokines and cytokines. So that's what happens. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm gonna focus on chemokines, but it's um, very important to remember or to keep in mind that all these cells, they really, the, 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 the communication is both ways, right? So they uh, affect um, each other uh, just as much. So um, for instance, if um, microglia and astrocytes are activated, they produce a lot of cells that both activate each other, but that then affects um, infiltrating 
immune cells. But on the other hand, all these infiltrating immune cells, they make a lot of these components as well that will then have an effect on microglion astrocytes as well. So sometimes we even don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg, but we do um, understand a little bit about how they affect each other. And then this is important because then um, we know where to intervene. And, and, and potentially treat some of these uh, pathological processes. So what we use a lot for our studies is both a look, we look in, in MS tissue, right? But we are limited in what we, uh, what we can actually do or when, when we can actually look in, inside the brain uh, of a human. So we use animal models. And I, I bet that you've heard of this before. I'll just go over a little bit um, uh, fast, just to recap. So what we do in EAE, for instance, this is this is kind of the the archetypal model to study immune responses in MS, and that's because we induce the disease, the disease by inducing an immune, immune response. So what we do is we give a target. Usually this is a, a small part of myelin, a, either a protein or even part of the protein, a peptide. Um, so we inject that together with this very strong um, stimulant of the immune system, an adjuvant. So this tells the immune system, go attack this target. Um, then we give them even a little bit more boost uh, to help uh, break the tolerance that normally it, a, a, a mouse or a system has for these, uh, for these molecules, because these, you know, these are self molecules, so you shouldn't uh, mount a response to that. So we help overcome that and we help open the blood brain barrier and then lo and behold all these immune cells that have been instructed to attack myelin go into the spinal cord and the brain and they start attacking myelin and you get this profound immune response with a lot of different um, 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 contributors so a lot of the different uh, players of the immune uh, response are there and this leads to an ascending paralysis that goes up. First, you see that the tail gets affected and then the hind limbs and then the forelimbs and then um, finally the mouse gets very paralyzed. So this resembles kind of um, some of the immune response that we see in MS. So a lot of um, what we know, we know through this model. Um, so if we look at this model and we first look at the the cells that you know should be in the brain and um, you know normally have their 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 homeostatic functions microglia and astrocytes we can see that they respond very early on so for instance in a healthy brain here microglia are staying in red and this was a model where they um, sewed two mice together so a green mouse and um, that has all their all its cells uh, were stained uh, are show show up as green GFP. Um, so every, all these cells uh, can then circulate into the recipient mouse. So everything that's circulating in your blood is green, but everything that's kind of in the tissues is not. So you can see that normally there's no green cells in the spinal cord in this case, uh, but there's a lot of um, Microglia. And then if you induce EAE in these mice, you can see that very early on, very low score, there's actually still mostly microglia, but they look different, right? So they're thicker, there's, um, there might be more of them. Um, so there's, they're responding very much. Uh, so uh, we call them that, that that they're activated. So you have activated microglia in the spinal cord, but you don't see a lot of green yet. Later on, when the mouse gets the disease gets more severe in this mouse, you see that there's infiltration of these green cells everywhere, and it accumulates, and then there's a, a lot of overlap uh, when when the disease gets very severe. And actually, if you look into this trafficking, this joining and the, the ones that to go in here, that's what they showed in this study are the kind of the same flavor of immune cells. So these are monocytes that then become macrophages or microglia, um, which again are, are cousins, right? So when you look at the infiltration of these monocytes, um, if you, um, if the green cells that we put into this mouse, the recipient mouse, if they can 
um, migrate across a, a blood-brain barrier, you see that then the disease actually you know, just progresses as, as normal. So this is really important because then they, they uh, contribute to the, the pathology in these mice, right? But if these cells that were added and that were circulating, if um, they were altered so they can't cross into the blood uh, or through the blood-brain barrier, or they can't respond to these cues that tell them where to go, you actually don't get such severe disease. So in this mouse or in these mice, you do have the microglial activation in the beginning, but you don't have these monocytes that come in and you don't get very severe disease. So we know that microglia, first of all, they do get activated early on, and it is important for this early phase of the disease. But later on, it's more important that the peripheral immune cells come in and, um, and then contribute to the disease. So when we look at astrocytes in EAE, um, again, we can see that they're activated very early on. And this was done in a study where uh, these are reporter mice where astrocytes, they will light up um, when they become active. So you see in a, just a healthy mouse, there's some background this, a signal for some reason in these ears, but if you look in the brain and the spinal cord, there's nothing happening there. But you can see that very early on, these astrocytes start lighting up both in the brain and later in the spinal cord. You can see this, they quantified this, and you can see that this happens in the brain in red here and in the spinal cord in blue before the mouse really gets sick. So just as the microglia, astrocytes become activated very early on in EAE as well. And what does that look like? We look at this in, a, in my lab as well. So if you look at a stain for astrocytes, GFAP in yellow here, you see that normally there's resting astrocytes in the, in the uh, spinal cord here. Um, but then just before uh, animals actually show symptoms, we can see that these astrocytes look very different. They're bigger, they have more of this GFAP. And you can see that the CD3, so the T cells haven't really entered yet, they're still inside blood vessels. And then later on in disease, when these animals are very sick, you can see that immune cells have entered the brain here and the, the astrocytes are still very, very active. So already very early on, but then throughout um, uh, EAE, you can see that astrocytes are active as well. So when we look at some of the factors that astrocytes and microglia have been shown to produce, and, and a lot of these are also, have also been shown uh, to be, be produced by astrocytes and microglia, both in the EAE model, but also in, uh, if you look in tissue of um, MS lesions, uh, you can find some of these um, chemokines in this, uh, is this case. You can, you can kind of already see which cells might be affected by this because we know, so these are the ligands and they, they communicate with receptors, right? And the receptors are on immune cells. So for instance, the monocytes that I already mentioned that come in fairly early and are important for progression, um, they re can respond to a bunch of these cytokines that are made by microglia and astrocytes. T cells uh, that we know are very important um, have receptors that respond to these B cells as well. So we can already see that they might be communicating with these cells. So let's um, dig a little deeper in, in that response and I'll talk a little bit more about T cells now because um, they are one of the uh, major players of the immune response, of the, the immune response gone rogue in MS. They're not the only ones, but they're definitely the ones that we know a lot about. So, and like I mentioned before, um, one very important cell is the CD4, the helper cell. So normally it's kind of this superhero that fights off pathogens, but in, in, in uh, MS, this has, they, ha they have gone rogue pretty much. So looking at T cells, remember that they need um, that instruction, right, to, to know what to do. And if you look at microglia, and if you look at what they express on their cell surface here, but also what the, the cytokines and the chemokines that they express, that again suggests that they talk to T cells. So for instance, they make um, a lot of the cytokines that um, can actually recruit T cells, for instance, RAN-T, CCL3, like I showed before. So these are all cytokines that 
uh, T cells can sense and, and move towards. Um, but they also express the surface molecules, not only MHC plus two, when they are activated, they, they express these at, at higher levels, both the MHC plus two that can present the peptide to the T cell, but also these co-stimulatory molecules, right? And they also express uh, some of the cytokines that then can help activate the T cell that get it, gets into, um, into the tissue. And then in the end, this T cell gone rogue is kind of reinforced in, in its mission and then starts attacking or continues attacking uh, myelin and all the other sites. Um, so looking at what we know microglia express and produce both in EAE and in MS, together it just suggests that they do talk to T cells. Uh, we don't have clear evidence yet that they actually do this, uh, but it's certainly, they're certainly able to. Um, and the same is true for astrocytes. So they produce a lot of inflammatory factors. I already showed that they uh, produce a lot of cytokines and chemokines uh, that can uh, talk to immune cells. And this is one nice study. And this is looking actually in an MS lesion. You can see here in blue, um, GFAP again, the marker for astrocytes. And this is just normal appearing white matter. So this is unaffected white matter tissue uh, of an MS brain. Um, and then here is looking inside a lesion, so where there is already demyelination going on. You can see that these blue astrocytes uh, express, um, and this is a, a protein um, that actually makes them very reactive, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. But we show, see, so we see that these um, astrocytes are very active in inside lesions and that they uh, also make CCL2. And CCL2 was that uh, chemokine that was very important for these monocytes to come in, as I showed earlier, where they kind of go in hand in hand with, um, uh, and, and work hand in hand with microglia. So astrocytes make this CCL2 that can attract monocytes into um, the tissue. Uh, and they also uh, express a lot of other markers or uh, factors that can uh, shape inflammatory responses. So in this study, they actually showed that in the model of the EAE model of MS, um, these, re these astrocytes becoming reactive, it kind of goes out of control. And this factor that, um, that we just showed in this previous picture is very important for this kind of this snowball effect. So once they start expressing this, they actually activate themselves even more. And this kind of this vicious cycle of um, astrocyte activation then leads them to produce all of these factors. CCL2 is one of those, but there's other factors too that then help attract monocytes, for instance, but also activate microglia, um, which then um, mount or the, uh, contribute to this whole inflammatory response that goes on in the tissue. So these are some of the factors that they make, but there's a lot of other factors as well. Um, and so in this uh, CCL2, like I mentioned, uh, is important for monocytes, but we have some uh, indications that astrocytes also can attract or interact with T cells, because if we look in our experiments, um, and uh, Jacqueline Reed, a student in my lab, did this, and also the, the previous pictures. So if we look at uh, these mice that are affected by EAE, again, this is very, um, uh, severe disease, so they show symptoms. We can see that there's a lot of immune infiltration into the tissue. We can see these reactive astrocytes. And if we zoom in and we stain for T cells here in CD3 in green, we can see there's very close interactions between these cells, right? So you can see this astrocyte here. It's almost like going around and, and, uh, and wrapping these uh, T cells here and here. So this suggests that you know, they might be affecting each other. Um, so I mentioned that uh, you know, cytokines and chemokines are kind of the, the things that we think of uh, as the usual suspects in instructing immune uh, responses. And certainly, uh, like I showed, astrocytes and microglia can make a lot of these factors. But now I wanna shift gears a little bit just for a few slides 
and tell you about uh, some other factors that can also affect immune cells. And this is something that we uh, tend to not really think about because we don't always see it, but we know that it's there, which is the extracellular matrix. And I'll talk about two different components that affect the immune responses in, in very different ways. Um, so the extracellular matrix is exactly that. It's outside of the cell, uh, cell, so in between cells, and it forms this matrix. So there's a lot of molecules that are uh, not necessarily just proteins, but they're like big sugar chains, polysaccharides. Um, there's proteins with polysaccharides, and there's a lot of different components here. So this, um, it's, um, it's there for a reason, right? So it, it's probably also going to do a lot although it's very hard to sometimes study this. We, we do have to keep this in mind. So two of these components that I want to focus on are, one is hyaluronin, is these very long sugar chains, and um, um, hyaluronin can actually be sensed by cells, so we'll go into that in a little bit. And the other one is heparin sulfate. Heparin sulfate is a lot shorter, and heparin sulfate is, again, a sugar chain, but it's always linked to a, a protein um, and it works in a very different way. So let's first focus on this, that really big molecule, hyaluronin. So hyaluronin, like I said, can be sensed because it can bind to receptors and signal through it, and it's mostly uh, signals through a receptor we call CD44. And CD44 is expressed by astrocytes, um, but also by T cells. And that's important because then they can respond to hyaluronin in the environment. So uh, it's been shown before that in a lot of inflammatory lesions, including MS lesions, you can actually find a lot of hyaluronin. So here you see an, uh, an MS lesion. In brown here, you see myelin staining on the left. You can see where there's loss of myelin. Here it's already completely lost and here it's being attacked. And then if you look at hyaluronin, you can see that it accumulates where, um, where the lesion is and also in the active matter there. And we know from um, mostly the EAE model that in EAE lesions, astrocytes are actually really good at producing hyaluronin. So if you again look at GFAP for astrocytes and then you look at hyaluronin, you see that there's a big overlap. And if we zoom in, we can see that here too. So it's on the, on the surface of uh, the astrocytes, but also in between. So we know that astrocytes can make, when they become reactive in EAE, they can make a lot of hyaluronin. So to summarize a lot of research, um, what we think happens is that when astrocytes become activated, and we know it happens very early in EAE, and we can see that they're activated in MS lesions as well, together with microglia, of course. Um, they secrete a lot of factors, cytokines, chemokines, but also extracellular matrix components such as hyaluronin. And this hyaluronin, we show through a lot of experiments that this hyaluronin is really important for T cells to kind of latch onto with their CD44 receptor. So this helps T cells to actually get into the tissue and then get to their target. So that's one way that the matrix can contribute to an immune response. Um, the other way, another factor of the uh, matrix, like I said, is heparin sulfate. And the, these are these sh little side chains that are connected to other proteins. And, um, what's in, and the way that this works is very different. So heparin sulfate, as far as we know, doesn't really trigger any receptor, uh, doesn't really um, uh, act in that way. So it doesn't send a signal itself, but heparin sulfate is very sticky. So a lot of factors can stick to uh, heparin sulfate. So these include cytokines, chemokines, but also growth factors. And in that way, it can affect how these signal to cells. So the way that we looked at this, we looked at one cytokine that's very important in regulating this whole immune response, and that is IL-2. And I've shown you these different flavors of T cells before, but there's also normally a regulatory T cell. Uh, and this regulatory T cell is what normally tells your immune system to stop doing. So that's the one that actually instructs that SWAT team and says, like, says, okay, guys, you got your criminal, let's arrest him, let's go back to the precinct and leave 
these people alone, right? So um, these are very important and we have reasons to believe that in autoimmune res um, diseases, uh, something doesn't go right with these uh, regulatory T cells. And that's why we have um, an immune response that goes on too much. Um, so these regulatory T cells, they really need IL-2. They can't function with IL-2, but there's usually not a lot of IL-2 around. So um, what we've shown through um, a bunch of experiments that um, we hope to publish soon is that if you look again at tissues and then again at an EAE lesion, you can, that you can find both IL-2 and that it's bound to heparin sulfate because you can find that too. And we can even see it on these astrocytes um, looking like cells that look like astrocytes, right? So do you have these star-shaped cells? And we know also that in vitro wing culture astrocytes that they can make heparin sulfate. So when T cells enter and regulatory T cells enter this tissue, they, there is IL-2 for them that's bound to this heparin sulfate on the surface of astrocytes amongst others. So the way that we think that is important is that here in a healthy tissue, you don't have trafficking right normally, but then when you in MS, you have trafficking of immune cells in here, including these regulatory T cells. And through a lot of experiments, we've shown that regulatory T cells actually have a mechanism to, um, to uh, um, take this IL-2 that's bound by heparin sulfate, both on the surface of astrocytes, but also in the matrix, and that helps them survive and function and then suppressing that immune response that we don't want. And does that actually matter? Well, actually it does because if we try to treat EAE with, by giving regulatory T cells, we can do that and we can, um, we can actually lower the disease severity by giving mice regulatory T cells. But if these T regulatory T cells um, cannot access this heparin sulfate bound IL-2 because they lack the enzyme that does that, uh, we actually don't see this effect. So it does matter. So that's two ways in which the matrix can also affect immune response. And we think that astrocytes in this case play a really important role in that. Um, but to summarize, both astrocytes and microglia produce many factors that um, affect T cells amongst others. And that's what we focused on a little bit more because we know so much about T cells. And just before I um, get to the end of this, we have to remember that it's a two-way street, right? So I've, I've talked a lot about how the factors that microglia and astrocytes produce affect T cells and other cells. But these T cells can actually also affect microglia and astrocytes themselves. So if we look uh, again at this schematic um, that was actually done, uh, um, shown in, a, this, I took this from a very nice review by uh, Jeff Dunn, uh, Dung in um, Wee Young's lab. So I, I highly recommend uh, reading that because it's very nice and tells you about how microglia are involved in these processes. Um, so if we look again, at this, uh, this whole um, schematic, we see that the T cells produce a lot of cytokines that we know uh, have an effect on microglia as well. So um, T cells talk to microglia and T cells also talk to astrocytes. And this is a bit of an ugly picture, but it's the best that I could find. Um, there are actually some studies that have shown that astrocytes can actually respond differently to the different flavors of T cells that come in. And it didn't go into detail here, but you have, for instance, a Th1 flavor uh, that makes a certain type of cytokine, and we have Th17 that make IL-17 a different cytokine. And it's actually been shown that microglia respond more to Th1 cells and astrocytes as well, um, but that um, Astrocytes mainly, or that when Th17 cells go in, astrocytes are actually mainly the cells that respond, uh, and microglia much less so. So they, they, uh, microglia and astrocytes respond differently to different T cells that enter the brain. And one last really cool uh, study is that this can also be good because 
again, we have mechanisms to inhibit our immune responses, regulatory T cells, and there's a different flavor of regulatory T cell, TR1 called, but it's kind of the, the cousin of the, the regulatory T cells that I showed before. And there's actually, a, um, in EAE, you can, there's a treatment that induces these regulatory T cells, and that's if you um, give anti-CD3 in the nose, and they've shown that by giving that treatment, you actually induce the regulatory TR1 cells in the lymph nodes that are close to the brain. And then you actually, um, you can actually treat EAE that way. But to do that, this, um, these cells, they make the cytokine, again, IL-10. So again, this is one of those signaling molecules. But this IL-10 has to act on astrocytes. And the way that they did that is they, um, uh, injected a virus in this brain that shut down the receptor signaling in astrocytes. So these astrocytes couldn't respond to IL-10 anymore. All the other cells could still respond to IL-10. But if you uh, um, kind of cut out the, the IL-10 signaling in astrocytes, you actually lose this treatment effect. So in the yellow here, you see the treatment effect of this um, anti-CD3 treatment. But if you um, do the treatment, but uh, it can't signal to astrocytes here in green, uh, you can't treat uh, EAE anymore. This shows that these TR1 cells, so one, uh, the, the, the kind of the good flavor of uh, T cells, they can actually talk to astrocytes. And if they do that, that stops the immune response in EAE. Okay, so that was a lot, and it's only the top of the iceberg, right? So. Um, if we look at this schematic, this schematic already had some of these arrows showing how these cells um, talk to each other, but I think we can add a lot more arrows, right? Because it's all interconnected. Um, and at a certain point, it's going to be a balance between uh, which cells produce which factors that then activate other cells that, or that inhibit other cells that then comes together and either makes a lesion become worse or makes a lesion resolve or even prevents a lesion to be formed. So all of this crosstalk is very important in MS and in, in kind of the immune response uh, in MS. Um, so we're, uh, so we're still trying to figure out more of these arrows and there's still, uh, like I said, a lot to be done. And today I focus mostly on the T cells, but there's a lot of work that, um, that's being done on B cells, for instance, as well, and all the other cells. So before I completely blow your mind with the complexity, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining me today here at the Zoom and I'll take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you, Hedvig. Um, yes, I do see a couple of questions. Can you say them in the um, chat? Let me, I have to stop sh sharing. Let me go back to Zoom. I don't know how I can end my, oh, there. Will the share screen? Okay. Uh, new, no, stop share. Okay, yes. There you go. Oh, there's something in the chat. Okay, let's see. Manoj, during the recovery or post peak of EAE, uh, which cells tend cell tends to change its phenotype earlier than others? That's a really good question. Um, the limited knowledge that I have on this is that, and I'm focusing here mostly on the microglial astrocytes because uh, usually when so in EAE there, there can be a recovery phase so um, animals can recover spontaneously and usually you will see that the, the infiltrating immune cells will have left um, some of them could s remain because we also know that monocytes that come in uh, when they stay around in the tissue long enough they will actually look like microglia uh, so they can stick around a little bit but what we generally see after an insult, both in EAE, but also in the Cooperson model, a different model of EAE, is that uh, microglia seem to quiet down earlier than astrocytes. And for some reason, astrocytes can become or can stay in this activated state for a long, long, long time. So much longer than microglia. Um, that's probably not the whole picture. Um, I don't really know about the kinetics of the other 
uh, immune cells, like which ones leave first or which ones stay a lo around longer. So I hope that answered that. Um, we says, any thoughts on how the CNS tries to shut down invading immune cells? Um, oh, okay, yeah. So there's um, a neuronal mechanism to shut down inflammation. I'm not completely sure. I know that they express a lot of, uh, so microglia and astrocytes can express molecules that uh, tell T cells pretty much to, to die. So one of them is fast ligand, uh, another one is PDL1, so prog programmed death ligand one, which has great interest in, uh, in can the cancer field. Uh, TRIL is a one, another one of those. Um, CD200 is a very important molecule that signals both the microglia but also other immune cells uh, to kind of shut down their immune response. So these are some of the, um, the uh, factors that I know are expressed by astrocytes and some by microglia as well. I'm not sure whether neurons um, express some of those. So um, a couple of questions, great. Uh, my understanding is that MHC expression is key to self-tolerance. How does low MHC expression in the brain contribute to an exacerbated immune response in MS? Um, so that's, I'll tackle that one first. I'm not sure whether the um, low expression would actually contribute to the exacerbated immune response. I think what we think is that increased expression um, actually contributes contributes to the exacerbation and that maybe that low expression. So when a T cell encounters a cell that doesn't get very strong signals, so has low expression of MHC class two or not all the close stimulatory molecules, it, uh, the T cell actually becomes either anergic, what we call it, so it doesn't do anything. It kind of, you know, becomes apathetic or uh, just goes away or dies. So that could be happening in a healthy situation. And what we actually think in an MS lesion is that um, uh, microglia can actually have much higher expression of MAC class T2 plus these co-stimulatory molecules. And that would be enough for the T cell that has, the, so these T cells actually have to be activated already to get into the brain. We don't really know how that happens, but we know that it does. And these kind of pre-primed T cells then become reactivated again and then, and then kind of get a second signal to go ahead. So that's how we think that works in MS. And then the second question is, how do the MS-associated glia activation states change with age? How does it affect how peripheral immune cells? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, I haven't done a lot of aging research myself, but we do know that microglia definitely um, uh, change a lot in aging. Uh, and and first it was thought that they were kind of primed, that they would respond um, more quickly. It actually looks like they actually respond um, maybe slower, that they're, they're, they're less responsive. And that could also be because there might be different responses going on, because Michael, I haven't really talked to uh, about this, but they can respond in different ways. So um, and we don't know if this is the same microglia that re can respond in two different ways or that there's kind of multiple flavors of microglia, but they can either become activated and pro-inflammatory uh, and then really abuse that, boost that immune system, but they can also uh, become anti-inflammatory. And I mentioned a bit that microglia are important in eating up myelin. So eating up myelin, a phagocytosis of myelin, is also really important for the repair process um, because um, all these bits of myelin are actually really bad to have around. They're very pro-inflammatory. They, 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 they prohibit uh, new myelin from being formed. So microglia actually play a big role in that. And um, research done by uh, Dr. Young has shown that um, it, in aging mice, this kind of getting rid of this bad, of this junk is um, much uh, less efficient in, uh, by microglia. So those are different for sure. Um, astrocytes also look different in, um, in the aging brain and they actually seem, there's very little information about this, but they seem to be more reactive. So they, they seem to have a bit of a prime state and then maybe in an aging brain, they might, um, respond faster than in a, in a, a young brain. 
Um, then a question from Dr. Hollenberg. Uh, you mentioned MMPs. Uh, can I comment on the potential role for proteinases? Yeah, they're very important. Um, they're very important in the classical sense of they, they break down, for instance, these connections of the blood-brain barrier and, and, and within the tissue, so helping uh, immune cells to enter the tissue. But they're also really important in um, cleaving other proteins that then become activated and that then that would normally for instance not signal but if they're kind of cut by a protease then they would signal uh, so they're actually important in in a whole uh, array of ways uh, which i haven't even touched upon and maybe in an in a, a future talk I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that um, Yes, please, students, ask questions if you have them. Any question, there's no stupid questions. So Jeff asks, over multiple relapse remission and MS progression, is there any evidence of permanent alteration to astrocyte behavior slash function in affected brain regions through epigenetic modification? Very good question. Um, we should look at that. I don't, I don't think we know. Um, um, certainly not in MS. I don't know if it's done in EAE. That's, um, um, it would be great to do in a, a kind of a re relapsing remitting model and then see if you have lasting changes in astrocytes or in, in microglia as well, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, good, something we should study probably. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, one more. Oh. Um, would you say immune cell entry via the blood brain barrier or the blood CSF barrier is more prominent? Hmm. I don't, I don't know. We know. Um, I think there's different opinions about it. Uh, some some like there are people that say that uh, the major route is through the choroid plexus. So that would be uh, from through the CSF um, and certainly also like you can see a lot of meningeal inflammation so that's kind of CSF all, all around the brain but then especially in, in EAE but also in, in MS we do see a lot of perivascular infiltrates and cuffs right and uh, we can see those you know in tissue in EAE but also in MRI you can see um, these very distinct um, kind of um, signs that tell you that there might be a perivascular lesion forming or that has formed in, in the MS brain. Uh, so I don't know if one happens more than the other. I, I don't think we can tell yet. Um, one more. Are OPCs and astrocytes able to present antigens as well? If they can, how does it affect the function in the lesions? Um, good question. So we know that they, um, that astrocytes have the machine can have the machinery to do so and it's been shown in vitro that if you push them enough yes they could activate the t-cell through antigen presentation whether that happens in ms lesions we don't really know we do see uh, sometimes we can see expression of mhc and some of the co-stimulatory molecules so that says that they might be able to um, but we, uh, we don't know yet. We don't have the actual proof that they do. Um, there was a study that came out not so long ago where they showed that, um, I think it was oligodendocytes. I'm not sure whether it was oligodendocyte progenitors. Uh, so I have to get back to that. But um, that study showed that they sometimes express MHC class two as well, and that they might interact with T cells. Um, I personally, Ha, have my doubts whether that happens a lot. Um, I think you can see it if you're looking for it, um, but I don't think that the study really showed that it happens a lot and to such an extent that these oligodendocyte lineage cells would actually um, activate T cells. And again, we don't have the experimental proof. I mean, we can do a lot of things in a dish, you know, and in an artificial way. But I don't think we have the experiments to prove that it happens in an actual organism, like a, a mouse or a, a human. 
Um, then maybe one more before we leave. It's 11 now, but I see another question. Do we see any significant activation of astrocytes in the A2 phenotype state in MS or EAE? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm very interested in that. We do not know yet. It's um, so far, it's, it's been hard to uh, get a good marker for A2 um, astrocytes and uh, for the others. A2 astrocytes are, um, so as I mentioned for microglia, astrocytes also can respond in different ways. So they can become uh, they become reactive in a way that stimulates uh, immune response in a pro-inflammatory way. We call those A1 astrocytes. And then they can also um, change into a state where they actually inhibit the immune response and become uh, more supportive for neur neurons and, and uh, healing neurons. And that's an A2 state. Um, so markers are very limited, especially like for histology, but we're working on it and we would really love to see uh, whether we can see A2 astrocytes in, uh, in MS or EAE, we don't know yet. Hopefully, maybe if I give this talk again next year, maybe we know. Uh, but yeah, keep you posted on that. I think we missed one question from Dale. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, any evidence of increased blood brain barrier permeability in MS? Uh, does this further drive neuroinflammation? Yes. Yeah, we do have uh, evidence of that both in EAE and in MS. So uh, what you can see, uh, for instance, when um, MS patients get MRIs, uh, what we can do is uh, we can give them gadolinium uh, that circulates, and then you can see that show up in the brain if the blood-brain barrier is uh, impaired there, because it will cross. And you can see that in active lesions, it, it definitely does. And we also know from the, the EAE model that the blood-brain barrier does get permeable. And we think that's because there's so much inflammation going on that that actually opens uh, those connections. Um, and yes, we do think that that drives, that makes, you know, it contributes to the, the snowball that's going down the hill. Um, uh, so yeah, good question. So with that, we'll end up the session. Thank you so much, Hedvig, especially for Thanks, your everybody. presentations. Yeah, great talk, great slides. Well done. Thank you. Thank well you so done. much. It was amazing. Well, hopefully I can see all of you in real time sometime soon. Yes. Stay I mean, safe, stay healthy. Bye. 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 Thursday.